Hello, and welcome to another episode of Risky Business. Uh, last time, we were looking at the entry.s file. Let's uh, see if I have it open here. I've been doing some other things. Uh, let's just close this. I don't need that anyway. Uh, yeah, I don't need this open anymore. Okay, so here's the entry.s file that we were looking at. And I think we mostly understand everything in it. Uh, we understand the assembly code, at least. Uh, one thing I should have probably pointed out that um, I didn't mention, I think, last time. Uh, going over the assembly, I don't want to assume that people understand assembly syntax. Uh, I've never properly studied it myself. I just kind of have picked up some of it from seeing assembly code, right? But um, for example, uh, we have these one times reg bytes and then these parentheses, parentheses and SP, right? And um, you might be inclined, if you're used to C, to think of that as like a function call. But I'm pretty sure uh, in terms of assembly syntax, uh, what this is saying is you're adding one times reg bytes to SP. That's like what the parentheses syntax means in assembly code. So it's an offset to SP. Like in C, you'd write like this, right? So in C, we have this um, uh, bracket operator on pointers. And we think of it as an array operator because like normally you're using that for arrays, but it's really a pointer operator. And that's just a convenient way to say the same thing as sp plus an offset and then dereference it, right? Like that's all the, all of those mean the same thing. And in assembly, that's what this is doing. It's a different syntax, but it means the same thing. So I thought I should probably point that out in case anybody was confused about that. Um, another thing worth noting, I guess, is that uh, I skimmed over the fact that these are stores and the loads. Uh, they're capital S-T-O-R-E and capital L-O-A-D. Um, I don't think those are the proper names of the instructions. So I wonder if those are like macros or something, or maybe they are the proper names of the instructions. They might be like pseudo instructions. I honestly don't know. Cause like on my, um, green card that I have here from computer organization and design. Um, we have like LBU, which is load byte unsigned, LD, load double word, LH, load half word, uh, and then there's like unsigned variants, there's variants for immediates, um, and so on and so forth. So I'm just curious, maybe we did see this and I just don't remember. It's been a little while again since I last streamed. But usually the instructions are not um, all capital like that and usually they're abbreviated. Uh, so I feel like that's probably like some kind of um, 
macro or pseudo instruction or something. So I want to look into that. Um, what else? Oh yeah, so we want to find out more about the syntax regarding this stuff, and that's what that Wikipedia page I had opened was about. So here we have weak symbol, and that was referring to this. But before I dive into that, uh, I have other things to point out too. I think we asked a question about this, about some of this stuff. Yes, we did. So we were studying entry.s, and we had two questions about the following snippet of code. This is the snippet of code we were looking at, and we had some questions about it. Uh, we were wondering why we move um, sp to a2, the stack pointer to a2. Uh, so that's passing the stack pointer as the third argument to the trap handler. And the handler in the Freedom E SDK doesn't use it. The other question was why do we um, CSR write uh, A0 to MEPC? A0 was the return value of the trap handler. Uh, but I didn't understand why we'd write it back to MEPC. And I think we actually saw that, the answer to that, uh, as we were studying it last time. It's because um, uh, when you do an MRET, that will actually jump based on the, the MEPC. Uh, you, so you can make it so that your trap handler uh, returns to a different place, basically. which we aren't currently using, but it's uh, an interesting point to bring up. And that's probably why that piece of code was there. Um, I said, I understand that A0 is the return value. Yeah. So isn't MEPC just to tell us what instruction caused the trap? And uh, I'm saying that no, it, it can also be used uh, because uh, MRET will uh, jump based on it. And then we got a repro uh, reply from Drew. Uh, I think Drew is the guy who did the... Um, do I have those open? It doesn't look like I do. Sci-5 has... Um, Sci-5.com uh, they have, um, oh, what do they call them? Like a video series, like what I do, except uh, shorter. Like there's just a couple, a couple of them, and they were webinars. That's the term I'm thinking of. They did a, a few webinars. So um, where can I find their webinars? Oh, right here. And in one of my past episodes, I don't remember which one it was, but I know I mentioned that I watched the first one. Uh, I was planning to attend it live, but I slept through it. <laughs> um, but I enjoyed that. And then I uh, like the day after I did that episode, or maybe like the same day, I don't, I don't remember. But after I did that episode, I watched the, the second one. And I'm probably not going to manage to um, attend the third one live either. Maybe I will, who knows, but uh, I watched the second one, the recording they have here, so you can see the, the recordings. I still need to put this on the links.risky.tv. Um, I'll do that. I'll try to remember to do that after this episode. Um, but um, you can watch the recordings, and they also have the slides up, and apparently the Q&A separately as well. But I want to point out some things from the slides on the second second webinar. So let's take a look at that. I should also 
normally to um, to get this so that um, my browser isn't like so that it's aligned with the the risky business thing. Normally, I put it in a split with just a um, an empty terminal as a buffer. But I'm thinking another thing I could do is go like that. And I know I thought of doing that before at one point, and I was like, wait, that's stupid. Uh, there we go, resize. But I think that was because when I thought it was stupid, that was because I was trying to put the buffer on the other side, which is stupid. <laughs> uh, I think this will work nicely. So what, somewhere like right there? That looks good. Now I guess my question is, if I do it that way, oh yeah, that works good. I was thinking that if I did that, um, it might change the flow of how my code looks. Um, I have it set up so that normally if I didn't have the, the buffer, the empty terminal that you can't currently see, um, then this, this window with NeoVim in it um, the gutter, I have, like, you see this red line? That's to tell me where 80 characters is. I have another at, like, 120 or something. And then it's just all red from there to tell me, like, you probably shouldn't have a line that long. <laughs> those are just reminders to, you know, keep things compact. I'm one of those people who does like it uh, not expanding too far horiz horizontally. And before I, when I actually made the the layout for the risky business stream, I made the the width of the uh, overlay that you guys see to be exactly so that it covers up the the gutter on the right hand side. But uh, now that's not really necessary. But of course I'm not gonna redo the the overlay anytime soon. But uh, anyway, that was a. A bit of a tangent, but here's the um, the slides from the second webinar, and yeah, it was Drew who did the the second webinar and the first one. <laughs> Presumably, he's doing all of them. Um, so let me see here. One of the things I know I want to point out is about the E fifty one core. Uh, it turns out they they actually do support PCI Express and other types of per peripheral, peripherals like that, like DDR3 and DDR4 and stuff. Uh, they support that stuff al already. I, w I was saying that I really wanted them to take the, the chip that they're releasing soon. Um, they're releasing a development board with it like sometime early next year. And I was saying, I really want someone to slap it on a ATX board so we can make little, uh, you know, little actual proper rigs out of it. But um, you'd probably need to like implement stuff like PCI Express. But no, you probably wouldn't have to. I think they've already done all that work for you. Yeah, so they have PCIe Gen 3, Gigabyte uh, or Gigabit Ethernet. DDR3 and 4, uh, data center accelerators, storage, SSD controllers, networking, uh, baseband. So they already support all kinds of good stuff in their Freedom Unleashed platform. Although, is, th is it the Unleashed platform that this new chip is? I think it is, right? Because it's uh, U54MC, I think is the the chip um, model number. So I think we might actually already have a fully capable chip. 
I don't know what the development board is going to look like, though. I was assuming it was going to be sort of like the High Five One, just bigger and beefier, you know? But uh, I'm curious now what all is going to be on it. If it's going to have, like, PCI slots, I I just don't know. Is it going to be like an ATX board, or like a full-on ATX board that we can play around with? We'll have to wait and see when they announce it, I guess, but... Uh, even if it isn't, though, I'm definitely going to be getting one of their development boards and playing with that a lot on the series. Um, and I really hope we do get like an ATX board that has one of those chips on it, because that's very exciting stuff. Now, was there anything else that I wanted to mention? It's been a while now since I watched this, so I might not remember if there were more things... I was going to point out from this, but you should definitely check out the webinar videos if you haven't already. If you're someone who likes watching Risky Business, you'll definitely enjoy the webinars too. So I totally recommend those. So I just want to look through here quickly and try to see if there was something I wanted to point out that I'm forgetting. But you can see just through the slides, like the kind of things they go over in this. It's a pretty good overview of their stuff, basically, and how it, like, how the technical details work on a kind of a high level overview. Oh, this, yeah, this is one of the things I wanted to talk about. I'm glad I kept looking. This is one of the things I wanted to mention. So I didn't know about this, but there's actually iCache reconfigurability. So um, by default, car complexes boot with an L1 instruction cache um, with all L1 instruction cache ways enabled. Uh, the instruction cache allows mapping of all or part of a cache way into the memory space dynamically. Um, this memory space is called instruction tightly integrated memory. Uh, this applies to the L cache as well. It's not just the I cache that can do this, and I think they mentioned that further down. Um, but this is actually really interesting stuff. Um, uh, they give some examples, like you could use item for deterministic timing. Um, when reconfiguring entire cache way, the other way acts as a direct mapped cache. So. Um, I don't remember the details of how how uh, multiple cache ways work. Uh, I know I've seen it like an overview of how that kind of stuff works at some point, but that was quite a long time ago, and I don't remember the details. But uh, it's not so simple as just having like the naive thing you would think of is a direct mapped cache, where it's just like really fast memory, right? <laughs> That's used for caching. But the cache is actually broken up into like multiple different uh, ways, I guess they call it. Uh, and it's kind of like um, they're synchronized. I, 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 um, I'd have to review how that all works. I don't don't <laughs> don't go to me to know how that works right now. Uh, we'll definitely study it at some point, of course, because we're going to be studying the hardware of um, Probably the Hi5 One, uh, the chip on it, I mean, because that would be like the simplest thing to study from. Um, and it's what we currently have in hardware. But I think even when we get the, the bigger, fancier board, we'd still want to study the hardware of the, the simpler chip because that's obviously like a better place to start from educationally. Um, but this is really interesting. So the idea here is um, you can reconfigure these cache ways. So here's like a two-way cache. So this is like the the first one, and then here's the second one in the two-way cache. You can reconfigure it 
so that like half of it is item and this means it's mapped into the address space and so you can use it like any other memory basically it's my that's my understanding anyway is that it's mapped into the address space so you can access it at a certain specific address and use it just like normal memory but it's going to be really fast because it's the cache that you're actually using and I don't know if you can do anything like that on x86 or um, x64. Um, if you can, I am unaware of it. I haven't studied the like Intel architecture in depth or anything like that. I just I've, I've always been more of of like a systems programmer, but higher level than this. You know, I haven't like studied the proper architecture. So all the low-level stuff is really new to me that we're learning about on this series. And um, yeah, I don't know if you can do something like this on that kind of architecture. I think you can do it on ARM. I think they mentioned something about at least one like variant of ARM being able to do something like this. But yeah, you can do this on RISC-V, and that's just really cool to me that you can use the cache in that way rather than using it just as a, a cache. Um, and so when you do that, the other part is going to be direct mapped. So this still works like a normal cache would, except it's like a one-way cache, right? It's just the naive direct mapped kind of cache. And you can do it more complicated than that. It's not just like you can split it in half or whatever. Uh, so here they have an example uh, where just like a quarter of this space, uh, it says halfway reconfigured. So like they took uh, one way here and said, I'm going to use half of it as item. And what happens is you still get a two-way cache um, like what the original was, but it uses this part of the cache and this part of the cache as the two-way uh, two cache. And then this one right here uh, would be the one that pairs up with the item. So it's orphaned and uh, is used as direct uh, mapped cache, like what, we, what you had up here, basically, the, the naive kind of cache. So that's my understanding of how this all works. Uh, and that's really interesting. Uh, it says you create an item by storing to it. So you just write to the the memory address where you can map stuff to, I guess. And it um, by doing that, it'll automatically create uh, an item. And if you store a zero, uh, a zero byte um, to the first byte after the item region, it returns the entire item space back to the instruction cache. So you can kind of allocate and deallocate within the, the memory mapping space um, to control how the, how the cache is used. Uh, it also mentions you shouldn't use, uh, you should not make assumptions about the contents on creation. So it's not like it gets zeroed out when you create one or anything like that. Um, I suppose if you understood very deeply how the hardware works exactly, you could theoretically, you know, figure out what's going to be in the cache when. Um, by like tracking what's going to get cached in hardware, like knowing the hardware and how the caching works, you could for a very, you know, a specific implementation say, I know how the caching works, so I know when things are going to get cached. So I know based on my previous, you know, memory accesses and whatever, I know what's going to be in the cache here. So you could exploit that in theory, but it's <laughs> obviously that's more of a, a hacker kind of thing. Uh, not a thing you would do writing like portable software or something. Um, but yeah, so they just say don't make assumptions about it. Um, 
it's determined by the address written on allocation. So, okay, so the size is determined by the address you write to round it up to the nearest cache line, of course. So that's interesting. So I guess you write to like from the start of where the memory mapped cache would be, you write to the end of what you want to allocate, I guess, something like that. I haven't tried this, so I don't totally know, but you get the basic idea here. Did they just, I think they accidentally put the same slide twice. Oh yeah, there's also physical memory protection. I don't know if we've mentioned that on the series, but I did know that was a thing as well. Uh, I'm not sure if there was anything else I wanted to mention. It doesn't look like it. I'll scroll through to the end here before I close this though. Yeah, so they go over the process of if you're a company who wants to uh, license their IP, kind of what the process is basically. And yeah, there's gonna be getting started with um, Sci fi Risk 5 Core IP, uh, which is going to be sometime November 2017, and it is currently November 2017. I haven't looked at the, the date that it's coming up at, but I think it's pretty soon. So, yeah, like I say, there's some cool stuff in here that you should totally check out if you're interested in that kind of thing. And I'm going to put this on the links.risky.tv in like the miscellaneous sec section at the bottom of it. But we should get back to studying um, the entry.s stuff. So I want to know a little bit more about weak symbols. I think I basically understand them. Um, like it defines a symbol, but it's, uh, it's, it's like has metadata saying that it's weak in the object file. So, uh, when it comes to link time, uh, if another, uh, object file defines the same symbol, uh, but it's strongly defined, it will take precedence over the one that's weakly defined. And then I guess that one you just, you know, strip out of the executable. Something along those lines. It's kind of like um, when you forward declare things like the, the function prototypes that you'd put in like a header file in C. It's kind of like doing that basically. I don't know if that would actually translate to, to weak symbols in an object file, but conceptually it's like the, the same kind of concept, right? So yeah, a weakly declared symbol does not need a definition. Whereas if you declare a strong symbol, but you don't provide a definition, you'd get an undefined symbol link error. Okay. That's interesting too. That that's also like uh, what I'm talking about in C with the the forward declarations, where you know you can put the just you just put the function signature right, and then you can use that symbol in your code, but um, at some point you need to put uh, implementation. But if you put an implementation uh, below where you use it, you'd get a you know a compilation error. Uh, and of course, other languages are smarter about that. Like in D, you can declare anywhere. You don't have to do that. But you can kind of see where that idea comes from in, in assembly, right? With the object files and how it's structured, basically. It probably makes compilation simpler to not allow 
declaring anywhere. But um, so the thing that's interesting a little bit to me about this is we do provide an implementation. So I guess that's we don't have to do this, but uh, presumably uh, this this is because we want a default implementation if you don't provide one, I guess. But if I'm reading the code correctly, which I might not be, <laughs> but if I'm understanding it correctly, this is saying jump to the current line it's on. So it's just repeatedly setting the program counter to the same value, you know, and just doing that in, in, in an infinite loop. Um, so it's like an empty uh, infinite loop in C, if I'm reading it correctly, because this is a jump. This is a label that says one, and then this is saying one B, and I think I think we ran into the, the B at the end before when we were looking at some assembly code really early on in the series, and that it was actually jumping to the label. So I want to check the actual like GNU assembly syntax documents to see if that's really the case that this is telling it to jump here, which like I say, would just be an infinite loop if that's the case. So weak symbols are not mentioned by the C or C++ standards. So inserting them into code is not very portable. But this is talking about like actually using weak symbols like you can do in assembly code. Um, not talking about like um, the thing I was comparing it to, like uh, forward declarations of um, functions. I you know, like the extern keyword, things like that. So those might not actually map to weak symbols in an object file. They, those might not actually compile down to that. Um, but you get what I'm saying about the, the comparison of how they're kind of conceptually similar. Um, So the GNU compiler collection and Solaris, Solaris Studio uh, have the same syntax. Uh, I don't really care about that. So like they were saying, it's, it's not portable, but you can do in GNU C or with Solaris Studio, you can do a Pragma week or uh, attribute week. So if you wanted to directly use um, weak symbols in C code, you could do it. It's just, you know, it's a compiler extension. It's not like a part of the standard. And even if you, uh, you were okay with using uh, compiler extensions, they're saying that um, platforms that support the same or similar syntax uh, you know, the semantics may di differ in subtle points. So there's a gotcha there if you want to actually use these that, you know, you really want to make sure you're using them right on the, the proper platforms, basically. Um, so here they're saying we're creating a function declaration. So that's, again, going back to the example I was using of a forward declaration of a function. You know, they're basically doing that, but instead of doing it the C way, they're using the compiler um, extension of the uh, Pragma week to declare power two. Although they they provide the the forward declar declaration right here, so I guess uh, the forward declaration of the function wouldn't be marked weak if you didn't do this. Maybe I don't know how that would affect things. Uh, specifically, but and you can also do it in the dec declaration with the attribute like that. And of course, you can put it in various places 
And so you can do it for uh, variables as well. And again, we see X turn. So, uh, you know, I was kind of on the right track in the my comparisons of what it would apply to. Um, Uh, let's see. So the nm command identifies weak symbols in object files, libraries, and executables. I think I might have used nm some before. I don't remember it. I'm used to the tool um, object dump, I think. obj dump. So this lets you display information from object files. And I don't know how it compares with nm. So nm lists symbols from object files. So I might have used this as well, but I think you can list symbols with object dump too. Just have it list symbols. So I don't know if those tools are redundant or if there are some uses for one that the other doesn't do and so on and so forth. I think object dump does a lot more than list symbols from object files, but I don't know if it totally covers everything that this does when it comes to that specifically, is what I'm saying. So here you see examples of it listing stuff out. So you give it an object file, and it, it gives you the symbols in it basically. And we see here how here you have C code, and then here you see the name angling that C++ does. So they mentioned that if you use nm, it'll be marked with a w for weak if you have a weak symbol, a capital W, and a lowercase w if it is not. And variables, it's either a capital V or a lowercase v. So there's one exercise you could do. Uh, I don't really have an object file on hand to test. I mean, I guess we could look at some random object file from one of our software projects, the uh, demos that are provided with the Freedom ESDK, but I'm not going to bother to do that right now. And I don't know if we have an NM um, in our tool chain that um, can properly read whatever formatting differences might be in a RISC-V object file, you know? I don't know if it would be cool with a different architecture or not. But um, yeah, like I say, an exercise you could do is uh, take some C code that you have and um, take like... Um, stuff that's just like forward declarations and externs and see if you can find the symbols with nm and if they're weak or not and compare that with when you um when you do the same thing but mark them weak using the presumably you would do this using gcc right uh, and use these extensions and see if it changes the behavior of what the compiler produces, basically. And presumably you would want to try this um, in cases where um, a definition is not provided and cases where a definition is provided within the, the same translation unit and see how that affects things. 
I'll probably do that exercise myself just because I'm curious, but not on stream. So anyway, okay, use cases. I was gonna say, I think we've pretty much learned what we need to know about weak symbols, but I wanna see what they have to say about use cases as well, and limitations, and related methods. Those all sound like worthwhile reading. Uh, weak symbols can be used as a mechanism to provide default implementations of functions that can be replaced by more specialized, uh, that is, optimized ones at link time. Oh, right, like what, we, what we're doing here, where we are providing a definition. So you don't have to provide a definition, and that's why I was relating it to stuff like forward declarations and extern marked variables. Um, But I guess the real point of this is so that you can provide a default implementation that you intend to override with, in their example that they give, an optimized version. So that makes a lot of sense then for why you would have something like this. And yeah, I guess in C, the way you would do that, it's just like the preprocessor, like um, having your definitions for the function uh, defined based on the platform. So you'd have like if def, you know, Linux, then here's the Linux version of the function and, you know, whatever. And you could do that for optimizations to specific types of optimizations. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say the comparison there is more of like the preprocessor in that case of may having multiple definitions that one of them is selected based on the preprocessor. Whereas this doesn't use the preprocessor, it's actually a feature of, of object files in the ELF format for object files. Uh, they have this kind of thing built right in. So it's kind of weird, you know, if you think about it, if object files, you know, provide this kind of thing, I mean, I guess because it's ELF specifically, the ELF um, file file format, something like um, what do they call it on Windows? Like COFF, C O F F, stuff like that. Like they have their own formats for stuff. They might not provide the same kind of features. So I guess I can understand why the C standard didn't spec like create a language feature for this, because it might not be portable between different you know types of object file implementations. that sort of thing. But if you were willing to, you know, restrict yourself to targeting, you know, like if you say that in your standard that your language requires, you know, it to produce object files that, you know, allow for this kind of feature, you could standardize something that takes advantage of weak symbols to have a convenient way to provide default implementations for stuff. Something, something to think about if you want to de design your own language, I guess. So they say you declare the default implementation as weak. Uh, that's pretty obvious. And they say, and on certain targets, object files with strongly declared symbols are added to the linker command line. Makes sense. If a library defines a symbol as weak, um, and I mean, that's the other thing you could do instead of using the preprocessor too, is you can just, you know, change up your command line depending on what platform you are in like your make file. That'd be another way to do the same thing. Ah, another use case of weak symbols is the maintenance of binary backward compatibility. 
that makes a lot of sense too that you could use that for backward compatibility uh, if a library defines a symbol as weak uh, a program that links that library is free to provide a strong one for customization purposes. Oh, that's an interesting use too. So if you write a library, I don't know if I know of any libraries that have ever done this. I'm trying to think. I feel like I've maybe seen that done before, but I can't think of an example off the top of my head where a library defines a symbol as weak so what you can do is you can define your own um, to customize to override the default behavior like I say I can't think of an example of a library that does that off the top of my head but I can definitely see how that could be a thing you might want to do in your library but again because of the portability issues I can understand why that wouldn't be a common thing that libraries do right but it's definitely an interesting idea so limitations so far I'd say the main limitation would be portability issues, right? Because it's kind of tied to the object file format you're using and to the compiler and the language standard and so on and so forth. So on Unix system five, descendant systems, during program runtime, the dynamic linker resolves weak symbols definitions like strong ones. Okay, uh, for example, a binary is dynamically linked against libraries uh, libfoo.so and libbar.so. Uh, libfoo defines symbol f and declares it as weak. Libbar also uh, uses the weak f from, wait, did I skip a line? Oh, uh, yes, I did. Libbar also defines F and declares it as strong. Depending on the library ordering, oh, okay, so it would depend on the library ordering on the link command line. That's interesting. I would have thought it wouldn't have mattered, the order, and then it would just use the, um, use the strong one. Like, the strong one would override the weak one, but it actually matters which order you link them in. I think that's more of an implementation limitation than a like an actual proper technical constraint though. Because because we're talking about a runtime thing, so you'd think it wouldn't really matter and that it would be able to figure out the proper thing to do. But I guess if you want the ability to control you know the behavior I guess I can see why you'd maybe want it to depend on the order. Uh, so the dynamic linker uses the weak f from lib libfoo, although a strong version is available at runtime if you linked foo first. So I take it if you linked bar first, it would prefer to use the strong version that it provides. Again, this would be something to, you know, make a little test program, you know, write a, write a couple of small libraries that just provide, you know, the same symbol and then have one of them be weak and the other one be strong and then see what happens <laughs> uh, when you do different orderings for the, the linking. So the GNU linker provides the environment variable ld dynamic weak to provide weak semantics for the dynamic linker. 
That's interesting. So if you set the LG dynamic week environment variable, what do you set it to though? Is it like a, a bool that you just say like I set this to true and then it like pr like uses week for everything that it's linking dynamically? Or is it like you provide a list of symbols you want to be weakly linked or something? Something to look into if you wanted to use that specifically. Uh, use the LD dynamic week, I mean. You're probably going to use the GNU linker unless you prefer like uh, gold. GLD. I don't know. I, is that is that actually the GNU? Like, what's the difference between the default LD? That says the GNU linker. Do I have gold on here? Maybe not. I thought it was LD.gold, so I might not have it installed, but I don't know if that's a GNU or something else. That's faster than the, the normal one, though. Okay, so here they're saying, depending on the compiler and used optimization level, the compiler may interpret the conditional as always true because funk can be seen as undefined from the standards point of view. An alternative to the above construct is using a system API to check if funk is defined. Uh, the above check may also fail for other reasons. For example, when Funk contains an ELF jump table entry. Using weak symbols in static libraries has other semantics than in shared ones. With a static library, the symbol lookup stops at the first symbol. Even if it is just weak and an object file with a strong symbol is also included in the library archive. On Linux, the linker option whole archive changes that behavior. So that's interesting to know too. Um, I would think you would prefer a whole archive as the default, personally. Like, wouldn't you want to prefer the strong version? Because typically, the strong version is going to be provided for things like optimizations. So why would you want the default? Like, wouldn't you normally prefer to have the specialized version? I'm not sure, but I just from what I've read on Wikipedia, so it's from you know what we've read so far. To me, it sounds like you would want that to be the default rather than the the one you have to provide with a switch. But uh, I'm obviously not an expert on the subject, so perhaps there are reasons you would not want that as the default. Uh, the weak function attribute. Uh, is supposed to be used on function declarations. Using it on a function definition may yield unexpected results, depending on the compiler and the optimization level. Related methods, yeah, so like I said, the C preprocessor and the build process, we kind of already figured that out on our own, that those are the comparable things you could do in C that are more like portable. So yeah, you can use the preprocessor to switch between different versions of the symbol. That's like what I would choose to reach for first. Um, the difference from weak symbols is that weak symbols are interpreted by the linker. Yeah, that's pretty obvious. Um, the build process can be implemented in a conditional way. Uh, and yeah, like I say, that's pretty obvious too. So I think we've got a pretty good understanding of what a weak symbol is at this point and how you can use them in C code and uh, how you can, you know, mess with the environment variables or linker flags to change certain behaviors involving them.
so yeah, the dot weak just makes it weak. So it says on uh, COFF the cough targets other than PE, and again I don't know the specifics of what like PE is, but it says they'd be a GNU extension. On the PE target, weak symbols are supported natively as weak aliases. So when a weak symbol is created that is not an alias, uh, the GNU assembler creates an alternate an alternate symbol to hold the default value. So uh, basically, you can do this on a variety of different formats. So it seems to be a commonly supported feature, at least. that um, executable formats provide. Okay, um, there's more stuff I want to see from the GNU assembler syntax. Obviously, we want to figure out about the, um, the 1B thing. Like, why is it B on the end is what I want to know. Uh, is there other stuff, though? It seems like this is using the C preprocessor. Which is a little bit interesting to me. I mean, I, I imagine this is, you know, always going to get passed through GCC and then get handed off to uh, the GNU assembler after preprocessing. I assume the actual GNU assembler doesn't understand the preprocessor. Um, so I guess I want to know more about sections, align, uh, global. Those are kind of the, the GNU assembly syntax things that I'm specifically wanting to know more about. So, section align global. Let's see if we can find some of those. Section. So I know there are different sections in object files, uh, but like I say, I haven't like studied an object file format, an executable format uh, in detail. So I could definitely learn more about what sections entail. Uh, use the section directive to assemble the following code into a section named name, right? So it puts it into a section of the object file. And there's like metadata associated with sections that you can see if you use a tool like object dump, for example. This directive is only supported for targets that actually support arbitrarily named sections uh, on a.out targets. And a.out, uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but um, they don't mean the name of the executable a.out. Like if you use GCC or probably any other compiler, I don't know what compilers do and don't do this, but the ones I use typically, uh, if you compile a, a C program, but you don't pass it to the output uh, file name, it defaults to a.out. But that's not what they're talking about here. I happen to know that the reason it does that, the reason it calls it a.out, is because a really old executable format before the ELF or ELF format, um, they had this a.out format that early Unix systems used. And I don't know the details of it, but that was like a, a, an executable format. I'm pretty sure that's correct. So I'll double check that for you guys, but 
I'm pretty sure that's what they're referring to here. Yeah, it says a.out is a file format used in older versions of Unix-like computer operating systems for executables, object code, and in later systems, shared libraries. So that's exactly what I just said, basically. Um, So what they're saying is that a.out didn't support arbitrarily named sections, so it is not accepted, uh, even with a standard a.out section name. That's kind of interesting. But we don't care. <laughs> so we're using Linux, so the ELF format is what we care about. So it says, this is one of the ELF section stack manipulation directives. The others are sub subsection, push section, pop section, and previous. So apparently it actually treats sections as a kind of stack, whatever that means in relation to a file format. So it says the section directive is used like this. You give it a name. You can also give it flags, uh, at type, and flag specific arguments. There is a sec name substitute command line option to substitute the name of a section apparently. And that's specific to the, the GNU assembler, of course. So here we see some example stuff. So we're saying uh, dot text dot entry. So I take it that's making a, a section for entry in the text segment of the executable, right? I mean, text is the, the executable portion. Like that's where your code lives inside an executable. And entry, of course, this is the, you know, the entry file, and this is the trap entry, so it makes sense to name the section entry, I guess. So in this example, they're making a macro exception code. They have section and then a percent %s um, dot exception. So apparently this is going to get replaced. Um, so you can have it um, in multiple parts of the executable. So you see there's one here dot text exception code. Uh, and then in init there's exception code. So it's like pasting this into each section and then presumably this is going to get replaced with the appropriate segment. So this is going to be in the text segment, or I guess, I don't know, would this be considered a segment in an object file or do they have a different name for it? I don't know. I mean, I guess it wouldn't be considered a section because the section has the section thing. <laughs> like this would be a section. The dot in it section. And interestingly, the macro does a previous and then end macro, I assume is what the end M is. So yeah, the two exception code invocations would create the dot text exception and the dot init exception. That's what I thought it would do. So, okay, the flags is a quoted string 
which may contain any combination of the following characters. A, which means the section is allocatable. E, excluded from executable and shared library. W is writable. X is executable. M is mergeable. S is the section contains zero terminated strings. G is uh, a member of a section group. T is used for thread local storage. There is question mark. Section is a member of the previously current sections group, if any. So I don't know what all this stuff means. <laughs> um, but it's good in the sense that we're, we're soaking in information. We're learning through osmosis. So number, uh, a numeric value indicating the bits to be set in the ELF section headers flags field. So yeah, like I was saying, uh, object files have metadata in them, like there is uh, section headers. So in the flags field for the uh, section header, uh, you can monkey around with that using this. And if one or more of the alphabetic characters described above is included in the flags field, their bit values will be ORed into the resulting value. So essentially what these um, these flags are doing is they're setting these these bits in a like presumably there's specific bits that these refer to and it's setting those bits in a flags field in a, a section header which is going to be used you know when the linker builds a proper executable i imagine it uses that information to to dictate some of the things it does you know like that is a, a vague understanding of what that's probably for. For example, I'd imagine if a section is not marked writable, uh, it would maybe be put into read-only memory. Like, like, I mean, when the executable is loaded It would hint that that section should be placed in read-only memory or something. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think when I think of an executable loading, I always think of like all the like everything, the entire image of the executable file just being mapped into memory. But I guess that isn't really what happens, is it? Because like the data section and the the text section need to be placed in specific portions of memory and stuff. So I guess the the program loader does need to parse the file and it would use these headers to determine where to place certain things in memory. And like that would explain like writable and executable flags and stuff. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud. Uh, target specifics. Some targets extend this list with their own flag characters. Okay. Uh, once a section's flags have been set, they cannot be changed. There are a few exceptions to this rule. Uh, hello, Library 18. Uh, today I am uh, learning about um, GNU assembler syntax specifics. So just um, soaking in technical information, <laughs> pretty much. Because we, um, on my series that I, that I do here, I um, read this assembly file and uh, we want to learn more about the GNU assembler syntax specifics. So right now I'm reading about 
stuff you can use using dot section, for example, because we we have a a section here. So I might as well learn about what that syntax can do, right? Okay, so once the section's flags have been set, they cannot be changed, but we were saying there are a few exceptions. Processor and application-specific flags can be added to an already defined section. Okay, so the interp, uh, string tab, and sim tab sections can have the allocate flag set after they are initially defined. And the uh, note GNU stack section may have the executable flag added. Interesting. Uh, and then there's optional type arguments. So there's prog bits. Uh, the section contains data. No bits section does not contain data. Note section contains data which is used by things other than the program. So presumably that would be like uh, debug information. That's the first thing that springs to mind. Uh, init array. Suction contains an array of pointers to init functions. Uh, finish initialization array. Uh, Suction contains an array of pointers to finish functions. Pre-init. Uh, so you can have pre-init functions as well. Uh, you can have a number which is set as the uh, section headers type field. I don't know what a type field is for. Uh, target specific. So you, targets extend it with their own types as well. It says many targets only support the first three section types. Oh wait, type, the, these are types. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what a type is, I think, but uh, it's these. So you could just set, set it using a raw number instead of using these basically. I guess the reason you would want something like that is because if there's a target that provides target specific extensions, but they were too lazy to define the proper target specific names, then you could just use a raw number. <laughs> I'd imagine that's kind of why this exists. But that's just a guess. Okay. So many targets only support these three, I guess. So the init, the finish initialization, and the pre-init, as well as the number and target specifics aren't necessarily supported. Many just provide these basic three. Okay. Okay, on targets where the at character is used to start a comment, another character is used instead. Uh, it seems that we are not using the at character for comments. I mean, I I can't really tell because I think this is getting stripped away for when it passes through the C preprocessor and gets parsed before it gets passed off to. Um, to the GNU assembler, because I'm assuming this, my assumption is the GNU assembler doesn't 
understand this stuff and this file has to be passed through GCC so that it gets this gets handled and then it gets passed off to the assembler but I could be wrong I mean I guess another thing I don't really understand about this is if we're including encoding.h and sci-fi-bits.h isn't that going to include a bunch of C code mixed in with our, I mean, not really code, but like, um, you know, defines and declarations and stuff. I don't know how that plays nice with the, the assembly code. I guess I don't have a very clear understanding of the pipeline that's happening here right now. but hopefully we'll figure that out at some point. Uh, some sections like text and data have special and fixed types. So I don't know if we really want to read all of this stuff because it's not really relevant to what we're doing. I think we got a lot of good information out of what we did read. Okay, and apparently the GNU assembler also supports some additional syntax that uh, uh, is for compatibility with Solaris. But we don't care about that. So my next question is what a line is doing. So I'm a little bit over time, but I kind of want to go a little bit longer. I think we're going to look at a line and then I'm going to call it a day. I might not stop streaming, but I think we're going to call it a day after we look at what a line is doing. It pads the location counter in the current subsection to a particular storage boundary. The first express expression, which must be absolute, is the alignment required as described below. So it's saying that this has three arguments, but we're only using one. I don't know if these other two are um, not required. They might be optional. So I'm a little bit curious about what exactly this means in terms of how alignment, how pat, like padding the location counter. Like, I don't know what that is for a subsection. I think we're hitting my limits of what I know about like how object files are structured and things like that. So I'm curious why we're aligning this to two. So it says the second expression gives the fill value to be stored in the padding bytes. Okay, yeah, it says this may be omitted, so that makes sense. So the padding bytes are probably just zero, but t they technically don't have to be. Like if it was um, marked as containing code and the fill value is omitted, then the space would be filled with no op instructions, typically. 
Okay, uh, the third expression is also absolute and is also optional. Yeah, so that's that makes sense that uh, we're just using uh, we're not using we're not passing the the optional arguments. We're just using the the actual alignment. We're setting the actual alignment to two. We don't care what the padding is filled with, and we don't care whatever this last one does. If present, it uh, is the maximum number of bytes that should be skipped by this alignment directive. So if doing the alignment would require skipping more bytes than this specified maximum, the alignment is not done at all. I don't know why exactly that would be useful. But again, like I say, we're we're hitting my limits of knowledge here. Like I've never looked into this kind of stuff before. So it'll probably make more sense over time, but right now we're just trying to learn through osmosis. So you can omit the fill value. entirely by simply using two commas. But we don't use commas at all. We just say align two. Oh, they're saying if you want to specify the third one, but you don't want to specify the second one. That makes sense. Okay, and apparently it varies from platform to platform. So on a lot of platforms, um, the alignment would be in bytes, which is what I was assuming is what we're doing. But apparently it doesn't have to be in bytes either. So we'd have to look up uh, what it does on the RISC-V platform specifically. And it didn't list risk five in this list here, so I think this might be something to ask on the I'm probably gonna ask this in the big risky business question thread. Uh I I want to know more about um where I can find more information about like the location counter that it's talking about and the like what a line is doing and where it would be documented um how much a line is um aligning by like what what it's a multiple of on risk five Because like on this platform specifically, whatever this is, it would be um, in words. Okay, and other platforms yet, it's the number of low order zero bits. The location counter must have after advancement. So yeah, like I say, I want to find where I can see what it would be for risk five. And I want to know why we set it to two specifically and where we can find more information about that. So I'm going to ask that on the, the forums after uh, today's episode. The inconsistency is due to different behaviors of the various native assemblers. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, GNU Assembler also provides B align and P2 align. So they're specific to GNU Assembler, but they have consistent behavior across all architectures. But we are not using those, so we need to know what align does on our specific platform. And with that, I think I'm going to call it an episode for today, and hopefully we will continue tomorrow. Or, yeah, tomorrow's a Saturday, but 
I'll see if I can work it in. <laughs> I'd like to, you know, do a lot more streams. But anyway, uh, thank you everyone who tuned in today, and thank you everyone who watches on the YouTube archive at Risky.tv. And you can follow me at HMN underscore Risky on Twitter to get updates about the series. Uh, thank you also to everyone who supports me on uh, Patreon. You make this series possible. And uh, I don't think there's anyone new, but I should probably check. If there's anyone I need to give a shout out to. I'm pretty sure I already gave a shout out to Danny Fritz, but just in case I missed you, there's a, a, a shout out to you. <laughs> but I think I already got him. So we're probably up to date. And with that, uh, I will see you in the next episode, and stay risky, everyone. <laughs>